shift um, to a setting like this. So what I plan to cover in the next 45 minutes really is, is an overview that everything that we find out at ASCAL is happening about assessment across the country really and some, some ideas and things of how people are grappling with life after levels and things and what uh, good formative and summative assessment looks like. So, so that's the title of, of things. Oops, if I can get that to work. Have you moved it on yeah. manually? Yeah. I'll, I'll see what, what happens there. So that's just really, what should we assess, how should we assess, what good classroom practice looks like, a bit about tracking and a little bit about Ofsted. So just that overview really for that. So in this country, we've got a, a system sort of fixated on testing. We've got metrics for measuring schools' performance at the highest level, at measuring um, the country's performance at the higher <laughs> level, and measuring individual performance at the highest level. So we've got a wealth of data. But is it always the right data? What do we do with it? And are there other important outcomes not necessarily measured by that data, really? And I think that's where, you know, I know a setting like this we're wanting to think today. Interestingly, there was a, a, an EU Horizon report that was published just last year that seemed to indicate that um, England was going in a, a different direction to Europe. So a familiar refrain there, really. But in that the rest of Europe is moving towards more self and teacher assessment, and we seem to be more fixed on more and more testing and accountability. So really just that backdrop, um, to put it in context. So we just seem to, there's a lot of uh, testing about. I think the first thing to think about with assessment is really to know what your ethos and ambition for assessment is like. Do you know what student success really looks like in your setting for that? And it's, you know, it's, it's how you're going to measure that. And we do have a tendency, as we know in this country, to make important what we can measure whereas there are other really worthwhile measures perhaps not encapsulated by, by that. And the, the Commission of Report Without Levels that came out last September really does signal a great opportunity for students to develop their own practice, and I'm sure you're going to be working on that today. So this is really what we're going to have a look at today. What is the most effective assessment practice that suits our particular setting, that suits the needs of our students as well? And how can we perhaps rethink what we've always done and not just recreate levels, really. I think that's the signal. I think that the problem with all the reforms going on at the moment is the pace of reform, and there's just one thing after another coming down, at you, down the track. And, and I think heads are just worn down by this, really, for that. But it is an opportunity to make sure that your assessment really aligns with your curriculum and that you, have, you find out then what student success looks like, are you measuring the right, the right things? And more importantly, then you can identify trends. And you can see, actually, then, are we meeting the needs of our pupils? Because that's ultimately what we're here to do. So that's really, that, that report, it is worth reading. A lot of it was devoted over to clarifying Ox Ofsted expectations, and I'll touch on that briefly. But just a couple of things about levels, because I think you, you know all this, really. But when we had levels, it really did focus teachers on trying to make sure that pupils got across the next threshold, really, that they cross the threshold rather than securing a really deep understanding of what they were doing, I think. That was it. And it was such a wide, open interpretation in a level, aggregated to one number. And crazy, uh, Daisy, crazy, Daisy Christolidou did some research on this, and uh, she took some level four readers, and she assessed their reading age, and it varied from 5.7 to 12.4 for a reading age, and yet they were all given a level four. So you can see the wide variety of abilities in that, and no wonder that led to an erosion of trust, really, between primary and secondaries, when you had those sort of labelled level fours going in. So there's been, you know, that, that was one of the issues. The other issue, really, was our accountability system. We were just constantly um, forced to evidence progress all the time, and that usually meant just moving to the next sub-level. So it, it sort of progress became synonymous with moving to the next sub-level all the time, whereas actually progress is much more complex than that. It's not linear at all, and actually it really does involve developing a greater and deeper understanding of something for that. So it also meant that we talked to the criteria in school. So it was really the system that created this <coughs> emphasis all the time, this relentless focus <coughs> on progress and evidencing progress. And that, to a certain extent, has disappeared, really, from, from that. So those were some of the issues, really, that was wrong with levels. 
The other key thing, I think, for me was that it encouraged um, a best fit approach. So you went for an overall number, whereas actually there might be really key gaps in a knowledge that that pupil needs in order to sort of progress in their understanding of a particular topic. So it became really about just assigning a label rather than really ensuring that there was a good understanding of it and going for that best fit approach. So, so that's why, in a way, levels have, have gone. Now, if I just illustrate that a little bit, and uh, you probably imagine I have not very good at press-ups. I've never been able to do a press-up in my life, but I probably don't need to be told that I'm a, you know, a minus one level in it or, or plus one. What I probably really need to be told is how to get better at it, really, and those really formative, personalised, individualised conversations, that formative assessment practice, is where we need probably to focus our energies rather than just assigning a label to something for that. And I think that's, that's the kind of thinking that's happening really about this now. It's prioritising much more on that formative assessment and not just relentlessly feeding a tracking machine all the time for that and taking control of your own assessment in school linked to your, um, your, your curriculum. So the report that was published made a number of recommendations. So they said, essentially, schools need to get better at understanding what good assessment is, what bad assessment is, why they assess, um, and what do they assess. And they talked about a national bank of questions, they talked about an effort, uh, expert reference group, but since September, and here we are May, there has been very little that has happened in, in assessment and schools have been left to their own devices really on this to try and work through this themselves and it's a really good idea today that you're going to be sharing practice in that way um, but we, there, there might be some you know Professor Rob Coe is involved in this who helped with the report and there might be some more things emerging and I'll point to a couple of things a little bit later so those were the recommendations if we look at Ofsted really because a lot of that report was given over to clarifying Oxford, Ofsted expectations and uh, you know, we all know that that sort of ultimate accountability has been driving practice. But this was their statement on Ofsted, or on assessment. And they've now moved, changed the judgment to teaching, learning, and assessment. So it is being given a higher priority in inspection. And it's in the leadership and management area as well to know what are you doing around assessment? You know, what, what are you, how are you going to cope with life without level? So, so that bit sits firmly in the leadership and management. But really, it's over to you, is essentially what they're saying. If you look at that last line, Ofsted inspections will be informed by whatever pupil tracking data cho uh, schools choose to keep. And when we've said to um, inspectors, well, how are you going to sort of get to grips with everybody's in two days? Well, we'll just have to. So it very much is over to schools to take ownership of this and to tell their story, really, and to be able to show you know, the evidence of progress in whatever way they want. There is no preferred methodology, no fixed way of doing it. In fact, they don't even use the word data in the handbook. They talk about assessment information. And that's been a deliberate um, chosen change on Ofsted's report to recognise the fact that they welcome all sorts of information about how you know you're meeting your pupils' needs and they are um, making progress. So these are the kinds of questions Ofsted are looking for in terms of assessment, really. The two things I would say what they want from anything is the impact of any assessment that you're having and the consistency. That's the only real thing that they're looking at for that. So if you've got something, is it being consistently applied? Is it understood by everybody, by teachers and pupils and everyone, really? So are your groups, because it's all to do with groups, are they being challenged? Are you using the information to shape your teaching? Are you using it to um, you know, develop, put in interventions in place? So it's a balance of formative and summative, really. But it, it's completely over to you, really, how you do that. There is no longer this idea of you know, in-class um, data having to show so many sub-levels of progress, really. So we are being given a real opportunity here to embed really effective assessment practice totally aligned to your curriculum. So, so that really is a key message. And I was very interested in this tweet from Sean Harford just last um, month, actually. Assess when they arrive thoroughly, monitor their progress, tell their story. And that just echoes what Seamus has just said a moment ago about the story. And whenever you meet Sean Harford, he's always talking about, tell us the story, tell us what your setting is about it. And we will, you know, we've got these skilled inspectors uh, now as they've sort of culled their team who will really understand the school's context and setting very, very quickly. So, you know, it is a, a, an opportunity to, um, to work on this, not necessarily get it right first time, but to keep evaluating and developing your assessment. So I'm hoping that, uh, you know, you'll bear that in mind today. 
assessment without levels actually doesn't mean no assessment without measures really so, so that they you know you have to be able to identify the trends and you have to be able to see what the impact of your strategies is and you have to ultimately see whether your pupils are making progress but it does give you control really for that for you know it does give you for, for your context your community and I think that is worth just really really highlighting as you go through the day today and thinking about what lies ahead um, that you're firmly in control of your your setting so if we just think now just a little bit about assessment and why do we assess in school and I think one of the key things one of the key reasons why we assess is we want to understand the impact of our teaching strategies on pupils we want to know if we're effective as teachers really we want to know if it if we are in enabling pupils to learn and understand and engage knowledge so it's really about getting information in order to shape and develop our teaching and that clearly comes through from the Commission's report as a really clear uh, driver for assessment being used in a way to sort of give you feedback really on your teaching so we've, you know we what do they next need, what do they need to learn what interventions do I need to put in place what do I need to reteach and do completely again so it's how well pupils have understood something really is what you want to do how what how secure are they and their knowledge of something really really tricky and dif difficult yes we need information about the likely outcomes as well we need to be able to report to parents as well and we need sort of we need to do something with the the, the data and I think why we made a, a mistake before a lot of the time really was that we focused on collecting data and we didn't necessarily do anything with it as much so we we need to be data informed but not data driven to the extent that we were before and there's a really interesting line in the report which says um, it's what it's not what's recorded that matters it's what's acted on that matters so that's the other thing that you've got to do really is to demonstrate the assessment information that you've got so what are you doing with it so what so every time somebody sort of hands you something so what next what does this mean for the pupil so what are you going to do next in your teaching how is that going to make a difference to that student and how are you going to shape and modify your teaching as a result of it so that's the sort of story and policy and things that you want to be talking about but it, it's really focusing on the decisions taken that the data gives you not the data itself and that is a significant shift as well that is in that and the emphasis really has shifted from much more emphasis on understanding learning and less emphasis on grading and I think that's what we're seeing coming through really not having to sort of assign a label a number to, to absolutely everything the other thing that you need of course is a much more varied approach to assessment so I like you know the idea of it's the servant of the learning which sort of reinforces what I've said earlier and not the master that you've got lots of low stakes frequent affirmative assessment going on that isn't high stakes for the pupils so that you really do understand what it is that they can and can't understand and do and I'll show you a model of that a little bit later about how that's really effective and yes you do need good in, uh, effective summative um, assessment as well and standardized and that's the other area that Ofsted would be particularly interested in is when you are presenting things how do you know so it's the accuracy and rigor of that and therefore the ideal opportunity in working with groups of schools collaborating moderating standardizing is really effective to, to, to make you secure in that understanding and of course peer and self-assessment really highlighted as well in the report the thing I would say about this really is that it does require some work in developing people's capacity to really do that very very well it can either be done well or it can be done badly so for example giving anonymized pieces of work giving work that's just plus minus etc interesting to start off with and building up and developing their capacity to be able to assess their peers effectively but really very very worthwhile so lots of you know you need a varied approach to that but what else might you want from an assessment system because thinking about today are there important measures that aren't captured by what we would sort of normally assess really and I think that that's the area that you want to think about you know how, how are you going to summarize the impact of everything else that takes place in your school really in order to be able to um, ensure that your pupils go on and make a useful contribution to society and I mean that could be things like social development it could be engagement it could be communication skills it could be capacity to learn you know all of those other things that really 
are um, so necessary, really, for young people today. And it's being able to have a sense of what the trends are in those and what the impact of what you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and those interactions, what the impact of that is having on those individuals as well. So, you know, the national measures don't fit all, really, and those other important outcomes are, are something to be thinking about and certainly worth thinking about your overarching assessment of how you're monitoring the progress of your pupils and enabling them to succeed. So I'll just show you this, which is an example, really, of a school that I came across. And they have um, the, f the last sort of five columns here are their habits, they call them, for their school. So there are other things that they measure and report on and see developing. And they might be things like the things I've just mentioned about social development, communication skills, team building for that. And so they would report to parents with those with exactly the same coding and colouring as they would report on some of the progress as well. So that's an opportunity that you've got your subjects there, but I can't remember the exact names of those habits, and because it's another school, I've sort of deliberately taken them out there. But I thought that was a really nice way of recognising the progress across a wider range. So yes, it's progress in, in their subject areas, but it's also progress that they, they need in other areas as well. And the fact that it had the same colour as well, I thought really signalled the importance of all those attributes um, to be what is a successful student, because that's what we're talking about, is what is, how do we know, what does success look like for our pupils in our schools? And that's where you fundamentally want to start with assessment. So thinking about, um, if you're developing an assessment model, really, these are the kinds of things that you would want to put into any model. So yes, you've got it based on prior learning, but it's for, it's pro, the emphasis is really shifting now onto progress, really. Progress from individual starting points for, for pupils and, and developing that core knowledge. So what, what are the key areas? Because you can't assess everything. Right? You're going to have to be selective about what you assess. So what are the key areas? What does a student need to know in this area before they can progress? And how are we going to assess that? So identifying those, that core knowledge. A mixture of both formative and summative needs to be easy to explain to parents. I mean, that's one of the reasons why the government wanted to, um, well, one of the reasons they wanted levels to go, they felt parents didn't understand it. So that it has to be easy for, for that. And clear about how the assessment outcomes are used. It goes back to that question I've said, so what? So what happens next? What happens as a result of the assessment for that? Um, and then how they'll be reported, reported. So a sort of blank overview of what you might include in an assessment model. Now, the new national curriculum, really, the, the focus with this is it's much more on ensuring that you have a depth of understanding of a particular aspect before you move, move on to the next bit of content. And that's how the curriculum has been designed. So it, it's thinking about what, what do they really need to secure a really good understanding of. So it's the big ideas or as some sort of researchers in this area call it, the troublesome knowledge, the points that students are known to find difficult, really, are the things that you really want to assess, the key bits that they need in your area before they can move on. So that, that's the sort of pathway that mo most people would, would follow, really. And then you would select your particular checkpoints along the way, whatever you call them, checkpoints or key performance indicators or big ideas or, or anything like that. But it's... it's being selective, as I've said, and not rushing in to assess everything, and not assessing things that are easy to assess, rather than assessing what should be assessed as well. So that's where you're already putting in new curriculum in place, new curricula, and then you've got to think about the assessment. And that's what I was alluding to earlier about the pace of this reform. Because at the moment, I think the most important job in any school at the moment is high-quality curriculum planning, when we've got all the new uh, curricula coming on board. But you must feed in assessment to that. And departments need time, really, to be able to do that effectively, to work out, uh, you know, what are we going to teach? How will we know pupils have been successful? What bits do we really want to assess before uh, we can move on? So those are the sorts of things, that, that those threshold concepts, really, if you read what most people are thinking about developing in terms of an assessment model, the big ideas. Lots of schools as well we're coming across at Askell at the moment are developing um, a growth mindset to, their new, to developing new assessment. The idea really that a, a pupil's ability isn't fixed and that they can develop whatever their starting point and they can make progress from, from the starting point. 
for, for that. And it's, the, the, it's focused much more on progress and effort. So we're sort of removing all idea of sort of attainment. Attainment doesn't necessarily tell you anything about an institution uh, as such, but it's really about the progress. So setting personal targets for pupils, we're seeing for that. And the idea that um, every pupil can make excellent progress, whatever their starting point, with the right support, with the right courage, with the right motivation. And again, that could be progress encapsulated across whatever metrics that you choose to use for that. But of course, whenever you're sort of thinking about the understanding that they would have, those categories of understanding, whether it's Bloom's taxonomy, solo taxonomy, should have a particular value assigned to them um, for that. And I'll show you uh, an, an idea of that in, in a moment as well. So that's the sort of area where people are, are, are thinking about doing at the moment, that we're coming across a lot of schools adopting that growth mindset model for, for their assessment for life after levels. This is possibly, I mean, sorry, this is another very clear example, but this is an example, again, of, of one school that's a, a, adopted this, really, in terms of having a mastery approach. So having key ideas, I mean, this is just year 7 D and T, I think, and it could just be one for art, for example. They've just identified the core skills, the real things that pupils really need to identify <coughs> and be able to do at the end of that whole term's work for that. And then they've actually decided to sort of, they've, they've gone for... Um, red, amber, green, but again, you could use any sort of currency there that you wanted to, really. And it's really assessing the progress of that, and obviously then the students respond, and you, do your ne you think about your next steps and that. But that's an idea that we're seeing a lot of schools adopting, really. So what are the key performance indicators? What do they really, really need to have grasped and understood? How well are they understanding that for that? And uh, reporting in that way, and pupils having ownership then. I think when I saw it, it was a sort of A3 sheet and it was kept by the pupil, and there were all sorts of little boxes that the pupils did things on, and it was their idea. They owned that progress then, and they knew how well they were, they were doing in mastering those key areas for that. So that was just another example. So it is, a, you know, what we're finding is that assessment is shifting from, to me now, what do pupils understand and what don't they understand? It's that understanding and that knowledge and the depth of understanding in particular areas and really ensuring that that's the case for, uh, for that. And then we're seeing really that when we're monitoring it, it's monitoring not the grading and the labelling, but it's monitoring at a granular level how well they know that particular subject and thinking back to the knowledge and the understanding and using the idea possibly of curriculum learning targets in order to set targets for the next piece of work rather than, well, you need to get to the next level or something, but actually identifying what, what bit of learning, what do they actually need to, to be able to do a little bit more of. So it's actually doing it by subject level. So that does involve quite a lot more of transfer of power and autonomy to middle leaders, really, because they're going to have to be responsible for understanding what that learning and progression in their subject looks like. Do they know what progression looks like? And do they know what those key performance indicators would be for that? So I go back to the point I made earlier about what we design into our curriculum really does matter at the moment for, for that, you know, that high-quality <coughs> curriculum planning for that. But we are seeing quite a few target setting, you know, the traditional target setting disappearing and being set the idea of what's next to learn you know, um, and, and assessment being used to determine what the next steps are in learning for that this way. So a, complete, a, a different way of thinking about assessment, really. And then tracking is, is, is something similar. So this is really just sort of reinforcing what I've just said. So what if the expected learning within the curriculum was moved as that flight path? So the flight path being to do with learning, really, of the particular areas of the curriculum and that, grant, that idea of granular assessment being based on subject knowledge for that. For that, so they can actually see what they, and so therefore you can have, you know, you have fantastic progress, lots of, depending on that individual and their particular starting point. Simple parental reports are, we, we, well, those that we're seeing being developed at the moment are simply reporting a progress measure. Now that sort of could be plus or minus. I saw one school that was doing it T plus and T minus. It was a school um, where they had a lot of um, pupils with English as a, uh, an additional language and therefore they wanted something really, really simplistic for parents to know whether they were you know, making progress or not making progress or whether it was you know, um, very good progress or not. So that, that's the sort of areas that we're seeing a lot of things happening. Um, and, and it's usually relative to starting point subject expectations. But through all of this, is this that culture of high expectations of pupils 
through that sort of growth mindset model that I was referring to. So if you're going to sort of think about summative assessment, really, because you will need effective summative assessment to sort of those key checkpoints to track that particular progress on the way. And I think the, the good thing about this compared to levels is that you can agree as a department or you know, across departments, whatever, what a standardised assessment should look like. So you're really clear on that. And everybody, there's a consistent approach. Everybody understands what that looks like, which wasn't the same with levels because of that level, as I illustrated earlier, open to such a wide interpretation of meanings. So really thinking about, you need to checkpoints to track that progress against expectations. And you need to sort of quantify what pupils are learning as they progress through that learning ob uh, objective. So how, you know, what terms, an underlying currency really to support that, how effective is that going to be, and however you do that is entirely up to you, of course, but that, that's the idea that you will need that to secure it. And you may well need more summative assessment as you approach the end of Key Stage 3. You don't need as much earlier on for that, for year 7, year 8, if you're in that setting, but far more as you get towards the end of Key Stage 3, thinking then about aligning that to future attainment, really. That's an example of then of what that solo taxonomy looked like, and we've seen quite a few schools adopting that model, really, for, to clarify and quantify the understanding that you've got, the depth of understanding in that. And uh, people are reporting sometimes in those and equating secure if they're going on to get a particular grade at GCSE. So there's all sorts of things around that that you can do in different models, but that's solo taxonomy model. So if we come back to a point I said earlier about... In the assessment report, it said, well, schools need to develop a better understanding of what good and what effective and ineffective assessment is. And Professor Rob Coe from Durham University has written this blog, actually. Would you let this test into your classroom? So if you're really interested in the theory of what makes good assessment, it's worth having a look at that. And he goes through a really good idea of what makes a good assessment. And it's very accessible to read, really clear, and you can access it from that. And incidentally, um, I'll make sure that Sarah has all of these slides so you can have them. I'll email them to Sarah today so that you can have them all emailed out to you um, later today as well for that, so you can get access to some of this. But this is something, this is just taken a little bit from it, but he goes through a step-by-step -step approach of what you need to do to design a good assessment, a good summative assessment for a group of students. So you might want to apply that to a range of things. But, you know, decide whether it's going to be a check-up, decide whether formative or summative, are you able to assess more than one learning objective, for example? Um, for other things, does it allow for all students to self-assess? There are a wide variety of questions. Assessment is a really complicated thing. I think that's why there's been this delay in, from the Commission, really, telling us how to do it. it, it you know, there's hundreds, thousands of articles written on what's make, what's make good assessment, and it's really hard to get right all the time for that. But that's some ideas of the kinds of things you could do when designing assessments. Going back to that formative assessment, because thinking now that with a new national curriculum, and we know how sort of heavy weighted and content that is, a lot of schools are using uh, this sort of mastery formative model to, to really develop their formative understanding of the national curriculum. Ultimately, pupils are going to have to learn a lot more than they have done, and they're going to have to um, be able to recall that information really quite, you know, a, a lot more than we've got rid of modular approach. There's a much more reliance on learning than there ever is just on a performance in a classroom because actually what a student can do on a performance on one day in a classroom is very different to what they actually might be able to perform and learn in, in, a, in a test at the end. So this idea of frequent revisiting, going back over with low stakes, frequent assessment linked to the curriculum is the idea, we, you know, the big threshold concepts are being taught, then they're being revisited and revisited and revisited and developed through that low stakes testing all the time. Uh, and that's the sort of concept that you might build up really, sort of low stakes assessments, interventions, carrying on through all the way through and repeating. And, and we're seeing that certainly as a model developing in schools to make sure that the students are prepared for when they sit their final examinations. I'm going to just touch on the last bit now, on formative assessment a little bit. And I, if anybody hasn't read that, I would really recommend it. It's really easy reading. What makes great teaching? It's a sort of Bible, really, for any head of department to have a look at and, and a discussion point for departments and teams. But it really is very, very interesting in that. And I would recommend it from Rob Coe. Uh, and one, one thing in it, really, is about um, Rosenshine's principles of 
uh, instructions. So this is essentially what they feel makes great teaching. And the bits I've highlighted in yellow really indicate that actually good assessment is good teaching. And we do it every day, in and out. And we need to reclaim the idea of formative assessment in the classroom, really, because we, you know, we've been, it's been the sort of pendulum has swung because of this idea of having to evidence progress and track everything that moves and things like that. We now need to shift that back and reclaim formative assessment and realise that good teaching, uh, good teachers are doing this every day in the classroom, really checking for understanding, etc., like clarification, independent practice, and going over and testing. Um, for that. So that, that idea of that, that um, booklet really does give you an idea of that. So just a little bit about testing before I finish. I've got a, just two questions here. And I just want you to, in your um, minds, to work out whether you're going to go for A, B, C or D for the first one. So the best time to test a student's understanding of a topic. Is it before you teach it, immediately after teaching it, after teaching with a delay to allow for forgetting or all of the above? So make your decision now. I'm going to ask for a hands up. Anybody for A? Okay, good. Uh, anybody for B? Anybody for C? Anybody for D? Yeah, the D's are switched on this morning. Good, that was not too bad. It is for that one. What about the next one? After studying a topic, students remember it most if they then A, study it again, B, study it again and take a test on it, or C, Take repeated tests on it without further study. Any hands up for A? Hands up for B? Hands up for C? Okay, right. Well, actually, the only the two brave people who put their hands up for, for, for C were the correct ones, according to the research. That's what the research shows. So that's the idea of you know, low-stakes testing. That testing of it can help that retention and that recall, thinking about the new national curriculum. The link to it is at the end of the research, if you want to have a look at it. So I've put all the references at the end. So it's pr from Professor Coe, so you can follow that. But did you want to make a comment on it? Also, that meant they got better at some succeeding the test. If they got better just at performing at a test? Um, They'd had, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's the case, but that's certainly, I think it's from Bjork's original research that really, it's a bit like saying reducing feedback actually helps people do better. It's the idea that they become over-dependent on it, but the idea that performance in a lesson is very different to performance at the end of a course, and it's really trying to ensure that the assessment and the curriculum is mapped and designed so that people do have the opportunity to uh, have to recall that without necessarily you know, f retrieve it from within. And that it, it creates better long-term memory, I think, is what the research shows. But it's worth having a look at it for, for that. And uh, Bjork was the original one that done that, and Professor Coe has picked up on that. So that's just a little bit about testing. But So it's, it's really saying about this rebalancing being required for, for that, in that we've had a lot of you know, summative, and now it's the idea of... <laughs> formative practice and we should be thinking about improving learning rather than just proving learning necessarily in a classroom situation for that and reclaiming what's always happened for that without recording everything um, and again that's part of what the report said so it's part of what the mandate that schools are able to do at the moment so just thinking about strategies in the classroom to to help you finally tell me these are all things that we know and do every single day, but these are the sorts of things which constitute really good formative assessment that happen on that and can be shared, and uh, classroom teachers can really go to town on them, actually, at the moment, without necessarily needing for that tracking. So good quality questioning, and we know sometimes with the questioning that the quality of questioning can make a difference between you know, an effective lesson and a really, really effective lesson. Quizzes, short, frequent tasks self-peer assessment, multiple choice, quality feedback, uh, and things like that. So it's this idea of really shifting that focus onto formative assessment. So really, I'll, I'll stop there and I'll take some questions really, but it, it's about striving for good educational assessment is something that we all really need to do. And it's, it's, we've been given this opportunity now to create our own assessments and it's having the time to do that really well. But it, you know, it, it is a good assessment. It's a feature of outstanding practice and always has been, really, and I'm sure you all know that. So I'm happy to take any questions that anybody would like for, for anything to do with that I've, I've uh, said for that. I've got a few, a few minutes before we finish. Nobody got any questions at all? Everybody's too... OK, 
Okay. Um, nodding and kind of agreeing with everything that was being said it really reinforces that we're on a really exciting journey and in alternative provision we've got a really exciting opportunity. Um, thank you so much for that Suzanne. As she said we will be sharing um, the slides at the end of the day. We're going to have two minutes just to change over now um, while we just get Carleen mic'd up and her presentation ready and then we'll be introducing Carleen. <laughs> 